I'm going to get back to some basics today. I'm going to teach a little bit from the book of Revelation. We're going to title it, as you see there, The Seven Seals and the Seven Trumps. Now, never let any man tell you that the book of Revelation is not to be understood because the very word itself means the unveiling. That's the name of the, whatever title or language, rather, you wish to translate it in. It means the unveiling or the revealing or to make known. So you're supposed to understand. But there is one very simple step that you must go through or you're never going to understand. The book of Revelation, any of Christ's parables, are the Word of God as far as that's concerned. And in as much as we're talking about the seals, let's go to the fifth chapter of that great book of Revelation and let's learn first before we begin on the seals how it is that we can understand them. Chapter 5 verse 1 and it reads, we're going through this rather quickly, just hang right on. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. Seven, of course, means spiritual completeness. It is complete. And that book, of course, is the Word of God. Verse 2, And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, not some sweet-talking little wimp, but a strong, loud voice with authority. Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Question. Now, that is the question you must ask yourself because if you don't know the answer to that, you're never going to be able to loose the seals into your mind with clarity. It's that simple. I might pause just a moment to say, do you see how simple the book of Revelation is? He takes you through the question. He's going to tell you now how that you acquire the information to understand it. Verse 3, And no man in heaven, listen to it, nor in earth. So if you're looking for a man to do it for you, forget it. There's no man in heaven, nor is there any man on earth, neither under the earth, uh, meaning uh, to the netherworld, meaning Satan or any of his little troopers, was able to open the book neither to look thereon. Couldn't handle it. Couldn't understand it. Couldn't do anything with it. Verse 4. And I wept much. Old John just let the tears stream. Because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book neither to look thereon. Verse 5. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Don't, don't, don't cry. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Who, who is the lion of the tribe of, of David? It's Jesus Christ, Yeshua. Only through him. Inasmuch as, why could no man do it? Because no man is perfect. He was. Therefore, he was worthy. And he opened it, and he explained them in such clarity. Verse 6, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, that's the four living creatures in the Greek, and the zoon, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, meaning this would be Christ after the crucifixion. Keep your, the timeline chronologically in order in your mind, having seven horns and seven eyes. Those seven eyes are spiritual completeness and are even the eyes of Zechariah chapter 3 that are, are God's election. They have eyes to see. Uh, through what? Through the Lamb, the Lamb slain, which are the seven spirits, the seven holy spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Have they ever knocked on your door, the door of your mind? Have you ever been called? Have you ever thought there might be more to God's word than you'd been taught? Why is it important that the word slaying would be utilized here? Because when 
the lamb was slain, you have to ask, why was the lamb slain? Who were these slayers? And what was the reason of the slaying? And then the information begins to come together, and it really knits the word together as well as the chronological order. Seven, and he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Who was that? God, all right? And this is speaking in a spiritual sense. Verse eight, and when he had taken the book, the four beasts, that's the four living creatures, and four and twenty elders, in my mind, this is the 12 patriarchs and the 12 disciples, fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, um, which are the prayers of the saints. Have you ever wondered where your prayers go if you happen to be one of those that has eyes to see? Do you think they aren't heard? They're even protected, guarded, my friend. Verse 9, and they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, all peoples, all races, uh, so forth, that know that land and know the W's, who, when, what, why, of the slain lamb. Learning that truth does what? It sets you free, of course. Verse 10, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Where? Where are they going to reign? Who is Christ bringing with him? And for what? In some cloud floating around? No, on the earth. 11, and I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Don't you ever let someone believe you that, or to tell you that those that have been slain on earth for the word or have believed upon God are laying in some hole in the ground. They're with him already. To be absent from this body is present with the Lord. 12, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive, listen to it, power one, and riches two, and wisdom three, and strength four, and honor five, and glory six, and blessing seven, the seven things that are the mark of those that are his children, those that follow him. Verse 13, And every creature which is in heaven, and on the earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessings and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth uh, upon the throne, and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Not a fleeting moment, forever. 14. And the four beasts said, Amen. That is as it is, in other words. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. The seal is released. In what? And through who? Through Christ. Through his teachings. We're about to go into the seals. In the 13th chapter of Mark and Matthew 24, each of these seven events, for there are seven seals, are drawn out in such a simple way that a first grader or younger can understand the seals. Because Christ has foretold us all things. Why? If you are worthy that he touches your eyes and touches your ears, whereby you can understand the simplicity and tear yourself away from traditions of men, uh, church systems, religionist, and simply listen to the word, you'll have no problem. Who do you need to understand? The one that has the power to open them to you. 
We call them seals. What, what, what is it that is sealed? God's truth, his word. Where is it sealed? Well, what do you use to think with? Your mind. It's sealed here, meaning you simply have the seal of God in your forehead, which is to say his truth. No big deal about that. It just means that you're not biblically illiterate, that he can talk to you and you can understand through his word. The six seals, seven seals rather, let's go with them, and they happen to be in this sixth chapter, verse 1. And I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals, I'm going to let you look, friend, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, that means the voice, uh, one of the four beasts saying, come and see. You're going to get a look at it. What is the probably the foremost um, seal of God's word and truth that you'd better make yourself aware of? And it is number one. It's not in chronological order as the trumps will be, which we'll cover in the next part of this um, lecture. That is to say the one following. Verse 2. And I saw. I mean, I could see it. And behold, that means look, look at it a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. I mean, he's going to be a king. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. Whatever could that mean? Well, let me give you a little lesson in Greek here on the word bow. It certainly isn't the bow of chapter 4 that is around Christ and the throne of God, which is the Shekinah glory that uh, as the rainbow brings forth through the prism the bands of all colors and light, uh, described as a rainbow, which you look up and see that beautiful cover, color. This word is toxin in the Greek, and it means, if you would... Um, it means uh, a cheap fabric imitation. I say again, a cheap fabric imitation. It's cloth. In other words, this is the false Christ. It is not the rider of the white horse that you will see being Messiah in the closing chapters of this great book of Revelation. So again, what is the foremost seal or the thing that you must have be aware of in your mind? That there is one coming before the true Christ comes that is right, it looks just like him, rides a white horse, has a, a, a cheap imitation bow, or that is to say, glory so-called around him, and he's going to be allowed to wear a crown. That's why he's called the prince of the air, or the prince of this world. You're going to have the king of this world before there's any gathering back to Christ by anyone, and you had better be sealed in that, or you will be deceived, period. Verse 3. And when he had opened the second seal, let's take a look at the second. Hey, there's no big mystery in this. The lamb slain had the authority to reveal this information to us. Listen to it. Open the second seal. I heard the second beast say, come and see. The second living creature, Zun, four. And there went out another horse. Another means one exactly the same. Only you could tell the difference. You know why. Another horse that was red. In other words, one of them was white and one of them was red. You shouldn't have too much... Difficulty telling the one from the other as long as you're not colorblind. And then that's why you have brothers and sisters to tell you the difference in the color. I don't want you deceived. That's my point. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. So what is this red horse? It's a war horse. That's how you take peace from the earth is by war. And they that should, and rather, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Now, Esau means red also, the, the Edom. Esau means hairy, but he, come, he is the uh, conqueror and his land is called Edom. And in the Hebrew, that is red. Um, 
we know that the sword that will destroy him is the word of God, which is a uh, comes from Christ's mouth, the same lamb that cuts both ways. So, what is this war? It's a spiritual war because it is amplified in, in the book of Daniel as well as in this book of Revelation that he comes in peaceably, but the war is against those that know he's a fake, that know he's false, as Christ taught so aptly in Mark 13 when he brought these seven seals forth in, into everyday life. Um, that there would be a war, if you would, of the spirits, of deception. Verse 5, And when he had opened the third seal, here we go, number 3, I heard a third beast uh, say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. Uh, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hands. Amos chapter 8, verses 1 through um, uh, 5 will tell you about this set of scales this dude holds. This black horse, of course, is famine, for famine will always follow a war. Verse 6, And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and wine. Very important that you note the oil and the wine. Number one, why? The oil is the anointing oil of our people, and the wine is that blood of the lamb that was slain. To those that have eyes to see and ears to hear, don't hurt that. Meaning, don't touch God's elect while you're going through this. But what is this penny? It's, it's a denarius. Um, which um, w it would take probably a day's salary and it would buy like a loaf of bread, meaning that the inflation following the famine then, which it all, a war, famine, and then inflation. And many today say, well, thank goodness we're not really, we, we buy much more than a, a loaf of bread today. Oh, do you? Would you want to open your books and take a look? How much usury? Let's take your home, number one. You work a full day. You pay a month's house rent. It could run, say, eight or $900. And it's according to what part of the country you're in. Do you know how much of that is yours? Maybe $15? $15 out of 1000 20 on the principal, and the rest is usury? Who are you working for, friend? Stop. You better stop and think about it. The deception reaches farther than many might think. Uh, verse 7. And when he had opened the fourth seal, let's take a look at this one. I heard the voice of the fourth beast. This, again, don't think of this as a beast like a, a growling, ripping, tearing uh, beast. It simply is one of the living creatures that protected the throne. All right. Say, come and see. In other words, you want to take a look through the lamb? You can, friend. What was it? Eight. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. That's death. Pale is always death. And his name that sat on him was death. And hell followed with him, the angel of death. Will you be deceived by him? It's real easy to confuse a pale horse with a white horse if you're not careful because the white horse will have appeared. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast. Now this word beast is different. This... Um, Word is tharun in the uh, Greek, and it means a venomous beast of the earth. Uh, in other words, the four hidden dynasties that are, in effect, that gain power over the people of all the world in international trade. Education, that's one of the four hidden dynasties. The political, number two educational, number three, 
And last but certainly not least, religious. The hidden dynasty of religion. For Satan will use religion to overpower the world by his peaceable, peaceable entry, pretending to be the savior of the world. You don't have to worry about it. And you'll understand why in the next lecture. Verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, here we go, number five, I saw under the altar, now what did we look under? The altar. What altar? God's altar. Well, what's under that altar? And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of, of them that were slain for the word of God, and for the testimony which they held, those that have the testimony of that lamb, where are they? Soul would better translate uh, self. Regardless of what body you're in, your soul is always the same. It's you. Your grandmother that served, great, great, great grandmother, I will say, so that I, not offend, that I do not offend someone that loved the Lord and passed on. Do you know where her soul is? The altar of God. She's not out here in some hole in the ground. So don't ever, I mean, God's word disputes that. But here also we have the saints that many of them have, even to their life, uh, but have always stood against death, which is to say Satan. Hebrews chapter two, verse 14. Documentation, verse 10. And they cried. What are they doing there under the altar? Or, and they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood? They had blood in their veins. And on, on them that dwell on the earth. So we know they were and had lived in flesh bodies that... Um, their blood needed to be avenged on earth, 11, and white robes were given unto one of, every one of them and was said unto them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet a little season, just a little while, until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. Now, you're going to find in the next chapter that Satan has given orders, I'm sorry, the, in the next lecture, that he cannot touch those that have the seal of God in their forehead. You could die a spiritual death, and it's a spiritual death we're talking about here. But God has a purpose for those that follow him. They are called fellow servants. Are you by any chance a fellow servant? Do you have eyes to see? Do you have ears to hear? Can you understand the word of God, the great revealing, revealing that is to say revelation? It's not that complicated. When you follow it in the simplicity of the teachings of the Lamb, because only through the Lamb his, his life, his birth, his crucifixion, uh, chronologically aligning you with time of prophecy whereby you know when prophecy is fulfilled and when it isn't. Verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. Yep, there's six of them. And lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Now, sharpen up for me. It is written in many places that when the true Christ returns, that the moon will not reflect the light of the sun. This is an imitation of that. And you've got to be sharp enough to understand that. Because, you see, the sixth seal, the sixth trump, and the sixth vial, or the seal, trump, and vial in which Satan appears as Antichrist, that 666, real easy to remember, sixth seal, sixth trump, and the sixth vial. I mean, it doesn't take a mathematician to understand the three sixes. 
13, what happened? And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. This is the trigger. Even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, it will happen in the generation of the parable of the fig. As in that same 13th chapter of Mark, you learn the parable of the fig. You were told to by Christ himself. Then you will understand the untimely figs. That means figs harvested out of season. Quite frankly, by a robber in the night rather than the true owner of the field or better said, by a spurious Messiah, rather than the harvest of the true Messiah. When she is shaken of a mighty wind, a rock, a spirit, uh, the spirit of God, that is when Satan is cast to this earth. Now the seals are not in chronological order. They're just, they're not. But they give you, and it's important that you understand them, for they give you the layout, if you would, of the events that will happen. You see, a trumpet is the execution of a charge, of a, an action. So we will find that the trumps are chronologically in order, but the seals are given in such a way, and which I choose not to go totally into it, that a person that is understanding of the prophecies has a twofold manner of under, bringing understanding of a countdown and then the action in the seals. But what we're covering now is sufficient for the moment that the Spirit of God naturally executes the order and command. And this is when Satan is cast from heaven again, as it is written in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, 14. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. We see that this is a benchmark that will not soon be forgotten. 15. And the kings of the earth and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men of the world, of course, and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Well, why would people do that? Well, many Christians would, so-called, would be hiding right with them because they would have already worshipped the spurious Messiah, thinking it was the true Jesus come to rapture them out. They want to hide, and more so, they'll even want the rocks to fall on them because of their shame. Why? 16. And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. That day's coming, my friend. They're going to know who the living God is that day without any question. 17. For the, day of, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? I don't know, there are six, but there were seven, right? I know who can stand. Those that have the seals in their forehead, which is simply to say the truth of God, his word. Now, in this seventh chapter of Revelation, you have the same as you do in the seventh chapter of Daniel. You have the four winds, which are the elements that, that hold back or execute the command to bring forth the wrath of God. And an angel will say, stop, we must seal the servants of God in their forehead. That means simply have them understand the word of God before the end can be. And of course, uh, 144,000, which 12,000 from each of the tribes of Israel were uh, brought forth and sealed. Doesn't mean that they were going to heaven. That wasn't the reason or the perp nor the purpose they were sealed. Has nothing to do with that. But that they would be sealed. And that consists, that is to say the information that, that consists of the sealing takes place within that seventh chapter. But hey, we had, we still lack one seal to have a complete picture here. 
where do we find that seal? Chapter 8 in this great book of um, Revelation and verse 1. Listen to it carefully. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Half an hour. Why would they say a half an hour? It's spiritual. I will explain following the next verse. Verse 2. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given the seven trumpets. So the, the seventh seal is a space of a half hour silence in heaven. It's real easy to understand that half hour when you take into consideration that in the 17th chapter of this great book of Revelation, which we will not cover in detail uh, in this particular lecture, but you can cover it yourself, that the spurious Messiah would have only one hour to rule over the kings of the earth. That one hour is symbolic, as you will learn in the next lecture, of a five-month period. But why would there be silence in heaven? Because it is written in the 12th chapter of this great book of Revelation, beginning with the 7th verse, that woe to the earth, for Satan is cast down upon you on his white horse with his chintzy, cheap, toxon, bow, imitation, fake, um, uh, glory around himself with his crown, which simply, what, don't, don't picture some nut with a crown on his head with a white horse. It simply, it is, it is God's way of using symbology to say that the spurious Messiah will appear on earth in charge. God's going to allow him to be in charge because the crown was given him or he was allowed by God himself to partake of the crown. And naturally, it is said in that 12th chapter, following along about verses 8 or 9, Rejoice in heaven! So they are rejoicing because Satan is, will never again, never, this is forever and ever, will never again be able to bring his presence before the throne of God. And by that I mean in heaven. On earth, he's already judged. He goes to the pit when he has accomplished the purpose that God has for him. And naturally, the half hour silence is to know that he is cast out and that there is peace because there is always peace when Satan is absent, the destroyer, the destroying angel the rider on the white horse that would look like Christ, but he's the Antichrist. What should you have learned from the seals of God that the Lamb of God would make known to you? That the spurious Messiah is coming to this earth first. For he will appear in the sixth, listen to me, and don't ever let some man pull you away from the Lamb's word, this man or any other man. And never let any man confuse you on this. If you learned any one thing, you note I emphatically and with emphasis drew out that it is the sixth seal in which the spurious Messiah de facto appears on earth. When does the true Christ appear on earth? At the seventh trump and within the time range of the seventh seal. So, what does it mean? Now really, I mean, think deep and long on this. If the Antichrist appears in the sixth seal, and Christ does not come back until the seventh to change us into our spiritual bodies and gather us to him, what does that mean? It means that you're going to be here on earth when this white horse, when this king, when this fake appears. God's word makes that very clear to you, very simple. Christ would say in Mark 13 where he draws each of these seals out in detail. 
that absolutely, not maybe, but the false Christ would come first. Why is it that some people can't see that? Because they're biblically illiterate. They never study the Word of God. They listen to men. And they listen to religious systems, denominations. And I love them all. Hey, they're doing their best trying to row upstream instead of turning the boat around and going with God's current. It's so much easier you know, to go with God's current, which is the Spirit, the Word. What have you learned concerning the seals? As I said, I was going to keep this particular lecture very basic, perhaps for someone that wants to begin a study, that there's only one way that is to place your prayers in the vial, that is to say make them, present them, ask for understanding with whatever else you may pray for, for it is heard. And the knowledge will be simplified whereby you, you will always find that God's word is just common sense. Though symbology is used, it's as though he's teaching children because symbology makes something very easy to understand. That's how he has handled the seals here. He even declared unto you that they were in the book, that there were seals on that book. And the Lamb of God slain. That is to say, Christ after the crucifixion would set in order the chronological order of events that would transpire whereby in your mind you could receive them and recognize them on the earth today when they come to pass. It's that simple. He's even simplified it past this. I have a work, Mark 13, Matthew 24, Christ's words of the end. Those seven things are in that. In our Revelation series concerning that sixth chapter, I go back to Mark and back then to uh, chapter six, and you see the simplicity in which Christ teaches. So, there's no excuse to not understand what's before us. Man only fears the unknown. Why would you wish to be in the dark about God's word when Christ has made it so simple for us? Don't miss the next lecture. The seven trumps are kind of like the frosting on the cake. We'll cover them in the next lecture. Okay, let's get, let's quickly we'll get into some questions here, okay? Now we're going to go to Charles from California. My question is about Ha'adam. Where, where can I document this? I couldn't find it in my concordance, and I need it for some people that have questions about it. Please comment. Well, Charles, it's the Hebrew manuscripts that say this. It's two separate words. Ha, H-A, in Hebrew, is the. It's like T-H-E in English. And Adam is the ruddy complected man. That's, that's what the word Adam means in the Hebrew language, in God's language. And to show blood in the face. It's real simple. All you have to do is, uh, I can tell you a way, if you're not going to use them, it would be quite a waste of money to not, um, to not use them to study. But first you have to have a set of the Hebrew manuscripts of the Word of God. And the least expensive way to acquire them is the set of Green's works that we carry, the Green's in a linear, here in our library. And then you simply turn to the place that it speaks of the Adam, not Adam, ha Adam, the. It's just like the difference you could say Christ and to a linguist, you would say, which Christ? For you see, there's the false Christ and there's the true Christ. And when you're dealing with languages, you should think as a linguist would think. 
and try to understand. Uh, uh, many, many times uh, we would say, the Christ. Well, to us, we would know who that was. That's why we call this the Shepherd's Chapel. Some might think I was claiming to be the, the shepherd. I'm not. The shepherd is the shepherd of shepherds, which is to say Christ. That's all that ha'adam means, okay? I hope that advice helps you. You can, you can explain that simply by repeating what has been said, for it is true. Paul from Florida. I have a question about the earth ages. There are three supposed ages. Well, they're not supposed. There are. Second uh, Peter chapter 3 declares that. Was the first earth age the dinosaur age? Yes, it was. Where does it talk about the first earth age? And was an age before this age? Well, we're in the second, and yes, there was one before this. And were there trees and so forth uh, and to be inhabited? Yes, it was right here on earth. Have you not seen the footprint, angel's footprint documentary? Um, and the devil's fall to that, to the earth being, bringing his angels. Well, and he was judged. That's the catabo. Um, I always like to share this. This is, this is from the first earth age. It's a mammoth tooth. You see the grinders. He was not a carnivore, which is to say to tear flesh. That's one tooth. Pretty good sized critter. I'd hate to have to rope that and brand him and do my year's work on him, okay? That would take some doing. And, um, but, yes, it was inhabited. Jeremiah chapter 4, begin reading with verse 18 will declare to you that God, when Satan rebelled and a third of God's children went with him, he destroyed, ev I mean, everything. Every tree, uh, every city. And many might say, city? Yeah, that's what I said. That's because why? That's what God's Word states. Now, many say, well, that's talking about Noah's flood, and they show their ignorance when they say that. Because God did not destroy uh, every tree uh, and what have you in Noah's time. Well, document that. Well, you can yourself. The dove was sent out, and what did the dove bring back? An olive branch. The olive tree wasn't destroyed because it takes the olive tree a considerable length of time before it can grow enough to produce a branch, all right? Didn't do it. Um, there are three earth ages. I look forward to the one that is to come when all evil is, is dispatched to the abyss. Okay, Marianne from South Carolina. You have really changed my life. I had cancer and I have been healed. God bless. Love the teaching. Our Father's Word does it, dear. And I thank God for you and the fact that you trust Him and love Him. He hears you. Bless you. Thank you. Uh, my two sons, and this is a mother from Tennessee. My two sons were killed 14 months apart. Both asked me to go with them to be baptized several times. I did not, um, I did not make time to do so before they died because I was working three or four jobs as a single parent. Do my sons have a chance? Of course they do, darling. You don't have to worry about that. A single working mom taking care of those two lads that loved the Lord. The malefactor that was crucified at the same time Christ was. When he heard Christ quote Psalms 22, which is Ila uh, Ila uh, Lama Shabbatene, which is to say pure Hebrew with one Aramaic verb, my Lord, my Lord, why hast, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was quoting that Psalm about how they would crucify him. And this, this thief, this crook, this malefactor was converted on the cross. And Jesus looked at him lovingly and says, Today I shall see you in paradise. He wasn't baptized. But Jesus said, Today I shall see you or be with you in paradise. And he was. So 
they're in real good shape. You see, John, uh, I know there are many people that would say, well, you'd have to realize you've got to be born again and baptized before you can go to heaven, otherwise you're going to hell. And they show their ignorance. I mean, we have a God of love. And there are circumstances such as this mother who loved her children and knew that she was responsible alone as a single working parent to provide for them and did not have the time to go with them, then it wouldn't exactly please God, but at the same time God understands and is happy with her for having taken care of those children. God uses common sense. It's too bad a lot of preachers don't. Okay, Alma from Pennsylvania. Don't you worry about them, dear. They're in good shape. Alma from Pennsylvania. My question is, were the souls placed in the offspring of the fallen angels of a type like the ones placed in Esau? Well, uh, um, not, not necessarily like the ones placed in Esau. Esau had one bad fault, and that was his heritage. The whatever the souls that were placed in the Geber um, were, um, they deserved what they got because God places the elect in the body of an elect. And he places um, Esau in a body that it's, it is, the body doesn't really have that much to do with it. It is the soul. But the Geber could be converted. Now, those that fell, they can't be. They're already sentenced to die, as it's written in Jude. And their penalty, because they left their place of habitation and came here to seduce woman rather than going through God's plan to be born to woman. Arlene from California. In Revelation, it says that only 144,000 are going to heaven. No, it doesn't, dear. Don't, don't buy that stuff. That's not what it says. It says that only 144,000 will be sealed in their forehead. It doesn't have anything to do with going to heaven. Well, directly. It's that they got work to do. They got to teach. That's why it was put in their brain so they could work in the millennium. All right? But John 10, 16 says that he has other sheep of other folds. What are the other sheep? We read of them today. Other nations, other peoples. God's the father of all peoples, okay? Uh, Elizabeth from California. What does God do when we tell a lie? Does God forgive us? Of course he does. The lie. A lie is not the unforgivable sin. I'm sure he's not proud of it, but when you reprint, repent, he loves you, and of course he will forgive it. Okay. Jim from Ohio. Why didn't the disciples recognize Jesus after he was resurrected? I know they did after a while, but why not... Um, why not at first? Please clarify. Um, I'm trying to think in Luke 24. Is it 41? I'm going to have to look. I, I, I just went. It will answer your question for you. Now, I know what the answer is, but I'm, I've forgotten exactly which verse it is in Luke 24. Um... Okay, and uh, they, okay, verse 11. And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. That's when they went there. Am I? I'm in Luke, okay. And behold, two of them went that same day, verse 13, to Jerusalem. It was about three score, about seven and a half miles away. And they talked together of all these things that had happened. And it came to pass, listen carefully, that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Here's your answer. It's in verse 16. But their eyes were holden and they sh that they should not know him. Their eyes were holden. That means that God closed their eyes so they wouldn't know him. Why would God do that? For you today to know that you better be real careful or you're not going to recognize the true Christ yourself. You'll accept someone else. It was done for you. 
that it's very hard for flesh man to believe and to understand, even when they walked with Christ on the earth, that he would raise from the dead and also that he would return. Jim from Ohio, why didn't the disciples, oh, I'm sorry, that's the one we just did there. Timmy from, don't know. How do I know that your interpretation of the Bible is correct? With so many interpretations, that is, the, there is a lot of confusion. I would love it if you were the one that is accurate, but I'm concerned because you never know who to believe. Please comment. You got the Word of God. Who's teaching the Word of God and who teaches you how to use tools so that you can check it out for yourself? I do. Does that mean I'm right about everything? No, I've made mistakes. Let's see, the last one was, I think it was in 1960. I can't remember for sure. It's been so long since I made a mistake. I jest. All right. Anytime someone teaches you how to check them out, mainly to drive you into the Word of God, for my, my son, that's where the truth lies, not in man. All right. Uh, learn to study for yourself. You'll never have to worry, uh, okay? Now, I'm out of time again. Hey, we're going to pick up the trumps tomorrow in a very basic way. What am I doing? Well, I'm showing you that God's Word is so easy to understand if you listen to it rather than traditions. Just let God's Word flow like honey over the buds of your mind. Now, uh, we're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, do you know something? Bless God, and He will always bless you. This world, at this time, needs our Father's Word. I thank Him for the platform that He has provided for this small church in Northwest Arkansas. This is most important. You stay in His Word. Every day in His Word is a good day because Christ is the living Word.